Hello, I'm John Paul, the coordinator of the Maltese NGO in Issyamet, the organizers of the Malta Mediterranean Literature Festival in Valletta, Malta. First of all, I would like to thank Versopolis for organizing this festival at such a difficult time. We can do with some hope, and we are very excited to contribute to such an initiative. At Initiamet, we believe in collaboration rather than competition. In fact, a main characteristic of our week-long festival is a translation workshop, in which our invited authors translate each other. It is a great way to mix our ideas, learn from each other, and then equally understand each other. If we beat the odds and we manage to organize this year's edition, at the last week of August, we will be celebrating our 15th edition. For us, the Mediterranean is this place that brings people together. And so we, so we also seek writers from both around us and from well beyond our shores. Among them, we have hosted Tamim Barghouti, Isham Matar, Sion, Marina Warner and Tasli Erdogan. And we hope to keep on doing so in the years ahead. Eric Ngale Charles was born in Cameroon. After nearly a decade seeking sanctuary as a refugee, he eventually reached South Wales, where he studied modern history and popular culture at Cardiff Metropolitan University. He has been selected as one of Britain's best 10 black and minority ethnic writers and has been described as a versatile writer who excels in various forms. His voice reaches out across the divide, across the land, from Cameroon to Russia and the UK, taking it all in. His work examines the horrifying experience of detention and of being the victim of human trafficking with extraordinary grace and lightness of touch. In June of last year, the first part of his autobiography, I, Eric Ingale, was published by Party in Books. In this interview, he will perform some of his poetry, while also taking us back to, t to his story of human trafficking and his hope that never faded out. Before Alexander introduces me, I have to take you somewhere so that you know my state of mind. Before I left my country, Cameroon, at the age of 17, Are those not shadows lurking in the place I once called home? Underneath this kitchen is our family shrine. Behind this kitchen is my father's grave. My grandmother, Auntie Sarah, my uncle, Mr. Ndumbe, my nieces, my nephews will join him soon. I do not care for the voices of my ancestors to rescue me. I am hellbound of that, I am certain. Is that not my sister I see? Is that not my uncle I see? Is that not my auntie, my nieces and nephews I see? Yesterday you loved me. Today your faces mask so much disdain, so much hatred. How long have you been planning this? Did we not fetch water from the streams of Moray together? Did we not fish together? Did we not climb the hills of Wely together? I am hell bound. Of that I am certain. And I do not care for the voices of my ancestors to rescue me. See, as I stood there, a can of petrol in one hand, a box of matches in the other, Gazing at my father's house with deadly intent, madness in my soul, murder in my mind. Just like today, the night was silent, as if it were holding its breath. Even the moon, the moon could not bear to watch as it hid behind angry clouds, the likes of which seldom trouble African skies. But as I move forward, to set the wheels in motion that will carry me into damnation. I heard my mother's voice piercing through the African skies. My mother spoke to me in the language of my ancestors and those before her. My mother cried. Agbe wolo atimbangundu. 
agbe wolo e ati mbangundu e we ye o ma we ya we ya nje e we ya o ma mo kaka me ma i turn around and i follow my mother's voice towards the house but there was no new dawn sipping through the horizon you see my mother's voice may have halted my actions on that day but i motimbeli the one who comes and goes. I, Yomandene, the guardian who lives on the mountain where my grandmother lived upon her death, a mountain of broken heart. I, Ekule Kule, the wise one. I, Eringale Charles, I will have my revenge in this life and not wait for the next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Eric Gale Charles here. And um, we'll do this session a little bit like uh, the uh, Desert Island Discs. <laughs> we'll intersperse the interview with, uh, with performance. And um, I'll start, Eric, by, uh, there's no need to introduce you again because the introduction was in English, so, um, so I'll just say that, or repeat that you um, are from Cameroon originally, and you came to Wales, uh, you, you made a very long journey to, to get to Wales, <laughs> and what you just performed is part of a play, isn't yes, it? Yes. And it's, um, it's a play that goes back to the beginning of that journey. That's correct, yes. Um, it's your story, and we often, with refugees, with migrants, with immigrants, we often talk about uh, their story. We want them to tell us their story, we want them to tell us their story so that we can understand better where they are coming from and what they have experienced and what they're experiencing. Um, your story is the stuff of tragedy. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it has all the ingredients of great tragedy. It has betrayal, it has rejection, you were cast out of your family, um, and all this was because of a family feud over inheritance. Mm -hmm. Now, you have told this story a number of times, and the last time you told it to children here in Malta. Um, you held a couple of workshops yes. with, with kids um, aged about 10 to 12, and you, um, you, you told them, you, you performed the story really, you told them about, about your childhood, about how it came that you left your country, your village, your country, and you ended up in Russia. That's correct. And, um, you also told this story to an artist, Maltese artist, Matt Stroud. Matt Stroud. <laughs> and we would like to thank him. Thank you very much. And he created these illustrations that you are seeing behind us. Um, you um, showed them to the kids. You told them uh, what, these, uh, what the story is that these illustrations are, are telling, but you also asked them to to write, and to write. Very creative, yes. Yes, yeah. Um, let's now go back to uh, the to the start of your journey. Um, and uh, when you when you left, you uh, thought that you were going to to Belgium to Bruce, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, to study. <laughs> um, well, once again, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Malta, Is Jamed, and the Mediterranean Literature Festival for having me. I, when I received the email that I have been invited to Malta, I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this thing has gone a full circle. Because on the 1st of May, 1997, I arrived in Malta. Um, I was six months shy to my 18th birthday. I was supposed to collect my transit visa. So when I approached the immigration desk and I said, can I please have my transit visa to Bruges in Belgium? The immigration officer simply laughed at me and said, Mr. Charles, sorry, you have a one-way student visa to Moscow. 
And you can imagine that uh, in Cameroon it was summer and I had a summer jacket. I mean, is this some sort of a joke? They said, no, your Aeroflot airline leaves in 15 minutes. So on the 3rd of May, we arrived in um, Moscow. But the piece that I performed is called Death on the Third Floor because until the age of 17, I grew up, my mother loved me, my father's family loved me. And then one day, my nephew and I we went fishing. And we didn't stop at my mother's house. When I say we went fishing, we didn't go to the Mediterranean to catch um, the fish that we ate the other day. We were fishing for tadpoles. You know, they hadn't completed their metamorphosis. They were still tadpoles, not frogs. So we thought this was with, so we ca caught a few. And I came to my father's house with my brother, uh, Leonga. And my auntie Sarah cooks it for us. And she calls me, Eli Kie, Eli Kie. You know, I, I told the children that um, when my mother calls me Eric, it means I've done something wrong. But if she calls me Eli Kie, that is a sign of love. So this is how my auntie called me. So she called me into the kitchen. And she gave us this nice food. And Leonga and I, we are eating. And then suddenly my uncles come home. He doesn't say hello or hi. He just walks straight to the kitchen. And next thing I hear is, Leonga, Leonga, Jai, Jai. Leonga, come, Leonga, come. So I'm thinking maybe someone, someone died. But I'm from a small village. If someone dies and so people start crying, it has a ripple effect. So aunties will be crying. Even if you don't know who dies, you just start crying. But nobody had died, so no one cried. Fifteen minutes later, Leonga is still in the kitchen. So I thought to myself, let me go and see what is happening to Leonga. But when I came there, the door was half open, half, it was ajar. And Leonga was sitting on the ground with his hands behind his head. Leonga was crying. And then my uncle looks as, at me as a, a lion would look at a wounded prey. And then my auntie comes and she says these words. So that was the first day I started dying. So my auntie says, Ngale, you are no longer allowed to come into this compound. If you come into this compound, we will kill you. So I'm thinking, are the stars aligned wrongly? Is this some sort of a joke? Is it April Fool's As, uh, so madness? Have they been struck by madness? I was clinically obese at the time, so my, body, my legs could not carry my body weight. So I struggled, and I reached my mother's house. But my mother was sitting with her back against the door, and she's crying. And my sister, Quinta, Quinta is crying. So I'm like, what the heck is going on? Is this some sort of... And then my mother blows into a handkerchief and gives me a letter. And this letter is from the Court of Justice in, Camer in, in Boya. And Chief Justice Epuli is inviting me to the courts because when I was 11 months old, my father died. But he, in his will, he left his six-bedroom house to me. But now I'm of age. But his family had gone and challenged the will, saying that I'm not my father's son. Now, to protect me from the threat that my mother saw was coming from my father's side of the family, in the middle of the night, my mother takes me to a place in Cameroon in the southwest called Tiko, and she hands me to the Jujuman, the, a, a witchcraft practitioner. And if I should take my clothes, which I don't intend to today, on all my joints, I have seven marks. So this person takes me into the middle of a children's cemetery and starts performing all these rituals. So he calls all the African gods, from Anansi to Yomandene to Ekule Kule. But most importantly, he calls my father to come and protect me. But the things got worse because he brings out a machete and lays it by one of the children's grave and reaches into his bag and brings out a sharp razor blade. And he starts with my forehead. So he cuts me there seven times. And what this does is, Blood then comes into my eyes. So in the middle of the night in a cemetery somewhere in West Africa, I am seeing shadows and things moving, but I'm thinking, does my mother really know what is happening here? I mean, there's a risk of a rhinoceros viper or a black man by biting me, and I will be dead. Nobody will be any wiser. So this thing carries on until the early hours of the morning. He makes some incantations, invoke all the gods. I never saw my father. I never saw Hamlet's skeleton or anything like that. But then my mother, uh, the next day then, this is how I went to court with all of these things and I look like a juju man himself. But eventually, it boiled down to one question. So the judge asked my mother, the boy sitting next to you, Erin Charles, do you know him? 
And mother said, of course, this is my son. He's the son of late Uskangale Charles. Then it became the question to my father's family. Auntie Sarah, the boy sitting next to you, do you know him? My auntie, the same person who cooked me fish the other day, the same person who called me Eliki. We've gone to the farms together. We've collected cocoa yams together. I helped her carry firewood together. My auntie looks at me and says, no, I've never seen this boy before. My uncle, Mulan Dumbe, says the same thing, that I've never seen this boy before. But the worst thing happened, my sister, Catherine, upon giving birth to Catherine, Catherine's mother died. So my father brought Catherine up. So growing up until the age of 17, I knew that Catherine was my sister. So the judge asked Catherine, the boy sitting next to you, Erin Galechers, do you know him? My sister avoided my gaze. She concentrated at the judge and told the judge, unfortunately, I've never seen this boy before. So the judge kicked my mother out of the court with myself and handed this property to my father's family. All the villagers who supported my mother came out and they were dancing with my father's family. They were even singing my favorite song, Joka Tung Mangui, Oli. But they were dancing. I was getting mad. So on our way home, there was a local gossiper, a village woman, Auntie Sarah. She'd been spreading all this news about my, my mother and I. People were mocking my mother. I saw my mother crying. I started planning vengeance. And the peace that I performed to you was my intention. When all I saw were shadows lurking in some, inside my father's house, I was going to burn the house. The one thing that rescued me was my mother's voice. And a few days later, I have my invitation letter, and I ended up in the capital of Cameroon. But things just got from bad to worse. So what happened next was <laughs> that you, uh, you thought you were going to study in Belgium. Yes. You came to Malta yeah. and you realized that you were actually supposed to board a plane to Russia. That's correct. So effectively, you were trafficked to Russia. I was, and I you was. ended up there. You, you, uh, were, your papers were taken away. You didn't actually have a visa to study. No. So you really had to survive. That's and this, this is your story. It's the story of survival. Yes. And it's uh, a story of also having memories of the happier days that took you through all this suffering. Yes. You spent, what, two years Two in years, Russia? two months, exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, and um, we have the book here, which is actually the first part of a, a, a memoir. And this is the, the book that recounts that period in Eric's life when um, he lived in Russia and he was trying to survive. Um, and uh, in the end, he managed to obtain a passport which didn't belong to him, and he traveled uh, with that passport to the UK. He intended to go to, to Africa. He really wanted I was going to go. To Bulawayo, to Zimbabwe. Yeah, you, you were you were you wanted to go home, yeah. but uh, you were also traveling with a passport which could get you into a lot of trouble because it wasn't yours. Yes. It belonged to a much older man, is a Zimbabwean, yes. and uh, so you came to the UK, and at Heathrow Airport, you, you realized that actually you know some people in the country, yes. and this is how you ended up in Wales. That's correct. And I remember you saying that actually you ended up in a country you didn't even know existed. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. So if, even if somebody had come to me, in my mother's kitchen and said to me, Eric, you, you, you end up in Wales. I'd have told them to get out of here because this is not something that you even contemplate. This is not something that you think, even coming to the UK was not even something that, um, but um, yes, the situation in Russia was horrible. So I had 3,000 3, francs CFA in my pocket. Which Eric, is, they yeah. are going to read about oh, it. Oh, sorry, because sorry. They're going to, <laughs> yeah. they're going I just wanted to clear, I just wanted to, 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 um, to make something very, very clear. So this is the amount of money that I had. But I started seeing some familiar behaviors. So if you're on a bus from Douala to Yaoundé in Cameroon, it will stop. And local people, will, traders, they will jump on the bus and they will start to sell you things. On the train from Moscow to Stavropol, which is three days' journey, where every time that train stops, people will jump on this train and they will start selling things. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is quite similar to what happens in Cameroon. So this type of behavior started giving me hope that actually 
maybe, just maybe, there is hope. But as you know, things only went from uh, bad to worse, yes. <laughs> well, and then back to, because you're sitting here, we actually have a happy end. That's correct, that's correct. You came to Wales, you now have a daughter. Yes, yes. Who mm -hmm. has just... Uh, she passed her A-levels. Her A yes, yes, she passed her A-levels yes. with, uh, with flying colours, and uh, she is half Welsh and half Cameroonian. That's correct. She's a lovely girl, that's I met her. Yes, thank you. And uh, you, importantly, you started writing. Yes, yes, I started writing. Because um, I, I realised that Love makes exile bearable. So despite all the hardship and everything that one went through, I always went back to the memory of my childhood. But my writing in Wales is not something that just happened. Um, I was invited to a conference in Clandidno, and the topic was literature and trauma. But I didn't understand what trauma, I had never even heard of the word trauma. So there was the BBC journalist called Katie A.D., who had just returned from Iraq. She spoke about the traumas of war, about the Taliban and all of that. And then there was a girl called Fazana. And Fazana was from Uzbekistan. And on her way to Turkey, she traveled with her mom and dad, but her, her father died in, in Uzbekistan. So in order to pay the human traffickers, Fazana's mother became a sex, something like a toy or property. Eventually, before they reached Turkey, she became blind. And Fazana was telling us this memory trauma. I'm, I'm thinking, oh my day. So there is someone who actually had it worse than I have. Mm. So on our way then from Clandidno back to Swansea, I had this kind of epiphany. The sights, the sounds, the mountains and the seas, the kind of the sheep grazing on the hills, they kind of reminded me of home. And that's when I wrote um, my very first poem, and it became the title of my first anthology. And the poem is called um, Between a Mountain and a Sea. So this is what happened. Um, can I share it? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, why not? Um, it's also, I suppose you should mention that this anthology was an anthology of uh, writing by, by migrants, by refugees. That's correct, that's correct. And you gave it this title because you suddenly realized that there is something that uh, you have found in Wales that reminded you of home. Yes. So that was, these were the first moments, I suppose, when you started connecting yes, the two. I, I started yeah. putting everything together. But let me tell you the truth, and this is an honest confession. Even though I was writing, the venom, the bile that I had developed in Russia kept getting worse. Because I, I hated my father's family so badly that it was only until 2013 that I decided to lobotomize that part of my memory and let it go. Um, but this, this poem is called Between a Mountain and a Sea. A story from a distance, they were my only witnesses. A mountain and a sea, whose lips engulf the green skies. A lasting kiss, washing her waves offshore, leaving behind a boat, that for my homecoming between a mountain and a sea. A shining mountain where sheep grazed, by which means my heart rejoiced. With trees keeping vigil like your mandene, the giant, the guardian, where my grandmother lived upon her death, a mountain of broken hearts, that for my homecoming. On a wet journey to Clanditno, I'm washing away pain and longing. A reborn voice is crying between a mountain and a sea, where sheep grazed and conversations were uncommon things. Please wake me from my slumber, and this poem will be over between a mountain and a sea. As soon as I wrote that poem, I, know, I knew effectively that I had arrived. I was no longer naked. I was no longer covered in the garments of an outcast. I was no longer stateless. I knew that I had found a home in Wales. Wales had effectively given me my name back, a platform, a voice, and thanks to Wales, my mother no longer cries at night. So you started writing and you found yourself in an environment where you were accepted, you were, you were helped, I suppose, by Welsh writers who read your work, who gave you feedback, and um, you, so you found also a new home creatively. Um, you then went on to, um, to uh, put together a, another anthology. Yes. And 
that anthology has two words in, in the title. Uh, what are they? The Welsh word is hiraeth, mm. and the equivalent in my language, Bakuri, is a rolly rolly. What does it mean? <laughs> hiraeth in Welsh means that longing for home. That may, may, may or may not be there. But it's all in, in Bakweri, a rolly, because after two years and two months in Russia, people had gone to my mother's house and told my mother that I had died. So my mother had extreme a rolly rolly, which means longing or missing that someone that you love, knowing fully well that they will never return. So this is what I thought. So when I went to Cameroon for the first time in 2017, I met my mother, but my mother did not recognize me. But that was not why I went to Cameroon. I went to Cameroon because I wanted to announce to the Cameroonian public that I was once lost, and I found myself a home in Wales, and Wales has propelled me to a, a platform where I'm recognized as a writer. But nobody knows me in Cameroon. So I wanted to go and see the Ministry of Arts and Culture to introduce myself. When I got there, the receptionist told me that, sorry, Eric, the, the minister just had his lunch and he's sleeping. So I was there for two hours, I never saw him. But as my life has been a series of coincidences, you might call it serendipity. I was sitting in the minister's office and a journalist comes in, Becky Bisson, and she has been following my progress on my, web, my, my, my blog post. And she goes, are you Eric Charles? I said, yes. She took me to CRTV La Radio, the national radio station, and introduced me to a guy called Charles Tembe, who is a senior journalist, and he runs a program called Literary Half Hour, which is broadcast to seven million Cameroonians. And he interviewed me there, and I told him what I was doing. The next day, we had 30 students in the Yaoundé, and I, I, I ran a couple of workshops. And when I came back to Wales, I told the national poet of Wales, Ivor Ablin, that this is my plan. And he was the first person who sent poems to this anthology. And the anthology was launched in, in, here in Wales, in August, during the Ice Ford, and then we went to Cameroon in 2018 to launch it. Now the weird thing happened. When I went to Cameroon for the third time, this is when my mother recognized me that her son has returned. So she didn't call me Erin Gallet Charles, my mother called me Oscar, which is my father's name. And I remember uh, when I was, when we were going up and down these court cases, my mom always stops and looks at this particular window. So I thought to myself, you know, let me ask my mom why she stops and stares at this window. But there are certain questions that a child does not ask the mother. She will either smack you or... So I said to my mom, Mom, why do you look at this window? And my mother laughs. So she taps me on the back of my head and says, Ngale, this is where I first saw your father. So in my juvenile excitement, I said, so mama, did you love my father? She never said yes or no, but she said, when I went to Cameroon for the third time, this is how my mother greeted me. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Love is what makes exile bearable. Uh, we are out of time now, okay. and I will actually, shall we finish with the last ritual, and we'll <laughs> ask, um, we'll ask Jean-Paul, uh, Jampo, can you come and read the to last ritual and then, please? The, the, and uh, the, the Maltese translation yes. you made. And before we do that, I would like to uh, remind you that there is Eric's book. Oh, has, have all the copies gone? Are they still. You, I have a new have manager now called uh, Keith. I don't know, Keith, what okay. are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, are there still copies of the book? Um, if not, there is another one. It's called Zero Hours on the Boulevard, and Eric has a story in it. It's an anthology which I co-edited, and I dubbed it the uh, Brexit anthology. It's, uh, the, the, the subtitle of it is Tales of Independence and Belonging, and it also has a story by Claire Azopardi, uh, because it's an anthology of writing from Wales and from around Europe. So. This is there as well, and uh, now I'll ask you to finish with this poem. Ritual Akhari, Dakina Klaabd Bilsin, Lien Sess Mafimj, Blingwa, Limanafsh, Nitrak, Shitan Isla Fodari, Tikmishiah Bil Modiet Tazmin, Yena, 
barrani fosta ġewwa. Nibki. Ma niftakaġ xolmti. Irraġi taxxem xi skansaw ġilti. Izzal bum bitop. Halla zdejni għal elf darba. Ma dawk li riedu juqtluni. Nitħak. Dan il-qabal tijaj. Dan il-qabal tijaj. Jina għwi għaffal għanal ċis. Et nissennik. Et nissennik. Tit finni. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.